And the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. This is how we like to see God acting in the world, directly, decisively, unmistakably. We like burning bushes and loud voices from heavens. We'll even settle for the still small voice if we must. And at the end of the book, the storyteller lets us know, this baby, Obed, this little red-faced bundle of joy, this one is a gift from God. God, giver of gifts, intervener in life, restorer and redeemer. This moment when the narrator announces the Lord made her conceive is all the more remarkable in the book of Ruth because up until this point, it hasn't seemed like God has done much of anything at all. No loud voice, no whisper, not even a peep. No divine intervention, no miraculous signs. There's no writing on the wall. It looks like the main characters have been left to fend for themselves. So when the storyteller tells us that the Lord has come on the scene, it might be fair for the people to have said, well, look who it is. Nice of you to show up. Or for Naomi to say, where on earth have you been? This morning, I'm going to tell you a story about where God has been. And if you remember the signs, wah, yay, you're welcome to join in. I won't discourage it. In the days when there was no king and there was no food, for a famine had come over the land of Judah, Naomi and her husband and two sons went to a new place to live, a place called Moab. They settled there, well, at least Naomi and her sons settled there, shortly after they unpacked Naomi's husband, died. Things have been a bit dicey between Moab and Israel especially since that time when Moab overran Israel and then Israel responded by killing their king, things were tense. Let's just say you wouldn't bring a lovely Moabite woman home to meet your mama if you lived in Judah. But you know what they say, when in Moab. (laughs) So, Naomi's sons marry two lovely Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth, and it becomes a regular weeknight sitcom. Judah meets Moab, 10 regular seasons and running. But in the 10th season, the 10th year, Naomi's sons die. Three widows are left with no income, very few rights, and even fewer prospects for food and welfare. Naomi knows that she and her daughters-in-law have been left in quite a bind. They hear that there's food back in Judah, so they decide to make their way home to Judah, to the city of Bethlehem. But she knows that equal rights and equal employment hadn't quite caught on yet in Moab or Israel. Security for women in that time came in the form of a husband, which Naomi couldn't provide. So she sends her daughters-in-law back to their own families. She says, may the Lord deal kindly with you, and may the Lord grant that you find security. They cry together for a little while, and Orpah goes home to her family, but not Ruth. Ruth clings to Naomi. This is her character through and through. Ruth clings to Naomi and pledges her loyalty and her friendships. She says to her, where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. So Naomi and Ruth go back to Bethlehem, and when they get there, they cause quite a stir. The last time Naomi was in Bethlehem, she was married, had two sons, and was all smiles. Now she's widowed, without sons, and bitter. Ruth volunteers to go out into the fields to glean barley so that she and Naomi will have enough to eat. She doesn't know it at the time, but... The field that she's gone to is owned by a man named Boaz. Boaz, as it turns out, is a kinsman of Naomi. Boaz is impressed by Ruth, by how she left her homeland to stick it out with Naomi, and he catches her eye, and he makes sure that Naomi and Ruth are well-fed throughout the harvest season. And Naomi sees that Boaz, this guy, he might be a good candidate to marry Ruth. So she enters into becoming a bit of a matchmaker. And this is where our story picks up this morning. Naomi sends Ruth to the threshing floor on a scandalous mission that she hopes will end in marriage and security for Ruth, a new beginning. Naomi's instincts are right. 
But Ruth's devotion exceeds Naomi's expectations because Ruth goes there seeking security for herself and for Naomi. Ruth makes the first move, acting in faithfulness, and Boaz answers in kind. There are some legal matters to sort out first, but Boaz manages to arrange their marriage. And then, at the end, God enters the scene and gives them a son. Ruth and Naomi have been the primary actors all along, moving, working, serving, scheming. And Boaz, you know, he plays his part too. After it's all said and done, the workload seems to have been distributed a bit unevenly to us. And we want to ask, God, where have you been? Are you familiar with this question? Is it one that you've asked? I have. What's interesting, though, is that in this story, this isn't a question the characters ask. They and the storytellers seem to know something that we don't. They know that when we act in faithfulness, when our faithful actions mirror the way of God, God is made known in the world. When we act in faith, God acts too. Let's go back again. Naomi prays in the beginning that the Lord would provide security for Ruth. And then Naomi says, I need to find some security for you. Naomi is accountable to her own prayer, and she fulfills the blessing that she wished to bestow in God's name and God is present. Ruth's steadfast devotion to Naomi, your people will be my people, where you go, I will go. Her faithfulness mirrors the promises that God makes to us throughout scripture. She echoes and embodies what God has said. I am your God, you will be my people, and I am going with you. Her faithfulness matches the main characteristic of Israel's God, God who keeps faith forever. The kindness of Boaz, welcoming the stranger, feeding the hungry, mirrors the kindness of God. Naomi gives Ruth explicit commands, but in Scripture, it's God who's the one who gives commands. Boaz spread his wings of protection over Ruth, but the psalmist tells us that it's under God's wings that we find protection. A baby is born. His name's Obed. They call him a restorer to life. The Scripture uses this phrase once more. The 23rd Psalm tells us God is the one who leads us beside still waters and restores our life. So we get to the end of the story, and in case we're still wondering who the main actor has been all along, Ruth and Naomi already know. God. God is profoundly at work in these coincidences of human and divine activity. When people make themselves open to God, God works through them in wonderful ways. When we act in faith, God acts too. And at the end of the story, the narrator is kind enough to let us know, this is where God is. This is where God has been. Sometimes I wish I had a narrator like that. (laughs) Maybe, Maybe you do too. Maybe today you find yourself wanting to ask the question, what are we to do in a world where God's presence is not immediately self-evident to us? What do we do in a world where famine has swept over the land, where our pantries have run bare? What do we do when jobs are scarce, the prospects don't look much better? What do we do when our young men and women sign up for the military out of devotion or because it might be the best chance they have and then we send them off to perpetual war? What do we do in a world when death seems like it's ever at our doorstep, in a deadly storm, in cancer, in disease, in a tragic shooting that takes a young girl's life? What do we do when the days just keep rolling on with little sign of anything extraordinary and nothing even remotely smacking of the divine presence? Just another day in which we're left wondering, is God hearing my prayer? In that world, in this world, Ruth would have us act in daring faithfulness, in feeding the hungry, in caring for the widow, the widower, and the orphan. Ruth would have us to watch over the stranger, and in doing so, God is present. When we welcome the outsider, be they from another country or from across the cul-de-sac, God is present. In this world, Ruth would have us act in ordinary faithfulness, greeting one another with the peace of Christ in church and in Kroger, 
laughing at birthday parties, weeping at funerals, saying blessings over meals as well as our students as they prepare for concerts, for plays, for tests and athletic games, sitting, in a friend, sitting with a friend in the ER until two o'clock in the morning, ordinary faithfulness. It looks a lot like friendship and God is present. A few years ago, my best friend made the nine hour drive with me to North Alabama so that we could sit together For three days, we listened to my dying grandmother's labored breathing in the adjacent room. For three days, we played Mankela, playing Mankela, listening to the sound of the stones drop on the board, waiting, going to sleep, waking up, and doing it again, and God is present. I don't mean to say that By what we do, we generate God or become some poor substitute for God's real presence. What I mean to say is this. When God says, do this, and we do it, we become a living sign of God's faithfulness in the world. More than that, when God says, do this, and we do it, God is working in and through us, and God is really at work. God is present in the midst of us, in ordinary things, in little things, even in a baby. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord gave her a baby, a son. In the final verses of Ruth's story, we join the family in the waiting room. And by family, I mean the whole neighborhood. This isn't the Duke Hospital maternity ward where you need special permission to get in. The whole neighborhood is invited, and the women's circle is the first group on the scene. You can imagine what they might say. Well, praise the Lord. Oh, I think he takes after his grandmama. This baby's definitely got a little bit of Moabite in him. He's going to make your parents worn out. But Naomi, he is making you look younger already. And I bet there was one who mutters under her breath, well, bless his heart. In the midst of all this noise and chatter and well wishes, Ruth quietly passes her baby to Naomi. As Naomi takes the baby, the chatter, the noise, it fades into the background. This little baby, her redeemer, her restorer to life, her grandson that is like a son, Obed. She takes the child, lays him in her bosom, and she becomes his nurse. Here I see the women's circle nudging one another, shh, shh, hey, hush up, look at this. And one says to the other, today a son has been born to Naomi. This is the final scene, Naomi rocking baby Obed. I imagine her singing him a lullaby or telling him a story, maybe saying, when there was a famine in the land and there was no king in Judah. Here we see Naomi cradling the full measure of Ruth's faithfulness. Ruth who said, where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Where you die, I will die. Ruth who worked in the fields to feed herself and Naomi, who crept down to the threshing floor to find security and from whose womb redemption has been born. Naomi rocked this little baby of redemption. Obed, the father of Jesse, the father of David. This hospital room scene takes us forward to think of another swaddled baby in Bethlehem some 30 generations later, when another mother will cradle her child in a time when the world is again in desperate need of a king. But the scene takes us even further beyond that, to the image depicted in Michelangelo's Pieta of Mary cradling the broken body of her son Jesus, having been crucified. Here in this scene, we see the full weight of Jesus' faithfulness. Jesus, whose faithfulness took him to the cross. And by his faithful actions, we are redeemed because Jesus is the one who finally says to us, where you go, I will go. Your people are my people. Where you die, I will die. But this one, the grave can't hold. This resurrected one says to us, Lo, I will be with you always to the end of the age. Amen.